Good morning, everybody. Apologies for the technical difficulties. <clears throat> so first, thank you all for showing up here bright and early on the first day. I know I'm competing with the World Cup, so I'm glad that, to see you all here. Uh, and thank you to the AQC Organizing Committee and the Programming commi uh, Program Committee for the invitation to speak to you today. I work in the Process of Development Group at D-Wave, and I want to spend the next half, half an hour talking about next generation hardware efforts we're making in our R&D team toward our next generation processor, our next generation product. Over the last 10 years, we've been focusing on building a series of ever bigger, scalable, tunable processors that implement the quantum annealing algorithm on an array of superconducting flux qubits. From the very beginning, our perspective was uh, from a systems perspective in terms of the technology development. We're focusing on the basic device physics, how to map the transverse IC model onto this macroscopic superconducting circuit. At the same time, we did early development in the IO, the filtering required to deliver signals down to the chip, the cryogenic stage itself. Uh, we did a lot of uh, uh, engineering on the electronics and then on the, the software stack around everything that allows users to interact with the technology. This co-evolution of all of these things from our perspective is key to building a scalable technology, to building a successful large-scale quantum technology. And it's really enabled us to successfully build bigger processors. Over the last 10 years, we've been more than doubling the number of devices in a processor every two years. The other thing that the other perspective, or this perspective has also allowed us to put these processors in the hands of users very early on from the, from the, the very first commercial offering, the D-Wave 1 that we fielded in 2011. Users both internal at D-Wave and in a growing customer base are interacting with the te technology and we're paying close attention to basic efficacy studies of the quantum annealing algorithm at these scales, as well as how applications are being mapped onto the hardware. We're paying close attention because the user feedback, both internally and externally, is providing some critical feedback for us deciding where to focus our R&D effort on our next generation hardware. The goal is to, to deliver major increases in performance of the quantum annealing algorithm with, with this development focus. And we've really focused in, in four areas. The first is uh, new features that allow users much more sophisticated control over the annealing process itself. We've been able successfully to deploy some of these features on our current product, the 2000 Kiva scale uh, processor. The other piece of feedback we've been hearing loud and clear from users for many years is connectivity. Connectivity, connectivity, connectivity. When you're mapping problems onto the hardware, the more connected your devices are, the easier it is to see a way toward uh, commercial advantage. And this is a key change that we're making on our next generation hardware. As these processes develop, we also pay attention to system overhead. The core computation time, the time it takes to evolve a Hamiltonian from some initial phase to some final phase, the so-called annealing time, is just one segment of the overall time it takes to run the system, to run the algorithm. We're focusing on keeping these overheads involved with sending problems down to the chip and then pulling the states of the results of the computation off the chip. We want to keep these small and fixed. We don't want them to grow as the technology grows. And finally, we're very concerned uh, and very focused on lowering the noise in our processors. Cubic coherence plays obviously a, a major role in driving the performance of gate model technologies, but it also drives the performance of quantum annealing technologies. And so we have a program to develop lower noise fabrication stacks to allow us to actually build processors that are more coherent than, uh, than they were before. I just want to say a few words about, oh, I lost the slides. I want to say a few words about annealing control. Um, so the, we've, on the 2000 qubit platform, released a series of features that allow users much more fine-grained, sophisticated control of the annealing process. For example, anneal offsets allow users on a per qubit basis to have control over the transverse field. We've seen some early evidence. There's a, there's a, a large body of theoretical evidence that, that this will produce performance advantages for quantum annealing algorithms, and we've seen in some test cases that by programmatically or algorithmically advancing or delaying the annealing process on a per qubit basis, uh, you can actually avoid or, uh, or mitigate the effect of first order phase transitions in certain problems. And we have some, some work that illustrates this as well as some, some other work externally that people are focusing on. 
We've also released more fine control of the, the time domain behavior of the annealing process. In particular, uh, a pause and a quench where users can insert a pause at some particular point in the annealing algorithm for some amount of time, and then a rapid quench, a rapid uh, reduction of the transverse field uh, at an intermediate point in the annealing algorithm. As we look at using this technology to produce samples, to produce samples drawn, for example, from a quantum distribution, uh, these features allow us to really study the behavior of the processor to try to dial in and get much better sampling midway through the annealing process. And finally, a relatively recent uh, protocol that we've developed is something called reverse anneal. This is a new quantum algorithm. It's, it's quite a departure from the regular forward annealing process, and I want to describe a little bit more about what this means. Reverse annealing is intuitively exactly how the name sounds. You're running the annealing process backwards. So you start with uh, preparing the processor into an eigenstate of the, the, in the computational basis at the end of the annealing process. So this is just a classical spin state. All the qubits are either up or down. And then you start out with the problem Hamiltonian. So I'm, what I'm plotting here are the two energy scales, A of S and B of S. Um, and you can see at the beginning of the anneal that things are backwards. The problem Hamiltonian is dominant and there's no transverse field. As you run the annealing protocol, the reverse annealing protocol, you go backwards to some intermediate point. You can dwell for some amount of time, in this case on the order of 10 microseconds, before quenching out. So why would you want to do this? Well, intuitively it gives you a, a tunable quantum local search. You can start in some position in your, in your computational basis, in your Hilbert space, and then turn on tunneling in some programmatic way to some intermediate point. You don't necessarily have to go all the way back to s equals zero. And so this, is, this enables basically a, uh, a much more capable, or uh, enables hybridization with, this, with classical heuristics. In particular, we think that this is, this is key for doing things like genetic algorithms, which we'll say a few things about, um, and sort of other, other hybridization with, say, parallel tempering stacks. Nick Chancellor proposed something similar a couple of years ago um, with the reverse annealing protocol, as did Hartmut Nevin and, and Masood Mosini at AQC in 2016. They had a proposal for a hybrid parallel tempering stack where you, you'd, revert, you'd use a QPU in reverse annealing and, uh, and feed it samples from some classical heuristic. So these, inc this increased control of the annealing process has actually opened the door to some really exciting results that we've been pushing internally. My colleague Richard Harris led some work, and he reported on this at AQC last year, simulating the transverse field icing model in a cubic lattice. I'm not going to say too much about this, this, this experiment. Um, you've, if you were at IQC last year, you would have heard some of the details. But by inserting a, a pause midway through the anneal and a quench, we're able to actually do a susceptibility measurement on a 3D AFM lattice where we can start with full AFM doping. So every edge in this lattice that we're embedding into the, into the D-Wave 2000Q is AFM, and then we can start randomly flipping the edges to FM. And we can trace out uh, locations of phase transitions but with a susceptibility measurement, get very good agreement with, with the expectation from the numerical simulations of this structure. Some more recent results. Um, this is work led by my colleague, Andrew King, and you're gonna hear about this in a lot of detail on Thursday. Um, but this is a 2D lattice where we have evidence for the, the system entering a topological phase in the square octagonal lattice, which we embed by chaining four qubits together into four Q chains. Now, a key piece of this measurement on the, the right is a measurement of the order parameter as a function of S, as a function of the annealing parameter. And we did these measurements. They said this is the, the, the lattice ordering at particular points in the anneal, and this is a key piece of the evidence for entering the KT phase. And we acquired this data with, uh, with using the reverse annealing protocol and an algorithm that Andrew's been calling Quantum Evolution Monte Carlo. And you'll hear a lot more about this in, in a couple of days. And finally, this is sort of hot off the presses. My colleague, Jamie King, has been uh, leading an effort in developing hybrid algorithms, so hybridizing the QPU using the reverse annealing protocol with a, a classical heuristic or a classical stack. So this data here is I'm plotting normalized residual energy as a function of computational time, the amount of effort that you're spending in, in computation, for a 2000Q anti-cluster problem. So this is a problem where the external couplers in the Chimera grid are set much more strongly than the internal couplers. And what we're plotting is the residual energy as a function of time for, in this case, the, the green and the orange are parallel tempering and parallel tempering with cluster moves. And you can see the energy burn down or decrease as the amount of time that you're spending increases. 
What we're showing in the, the blue is a reverse annealing protocol where you're just running many, many samples from an initialization of a particular spin configuration of this anti-cluster problem. And then shown in the red is a hybrid genetic algorithm. So this is using the hardware as a mutation operator um, and adding it to an overall stack, overall classical algorithm. You can see that the, the hardware, when hybridized within this genetic algorithm in this configuration, is actually outperforming getting to the ground state or getting to low residual energies over the other three algorithms. So we're excited by this, and we think this is very early days in terms of seeing what the hardware can do and how it connects with, uh, and how we can connect it to uh, classical heuristics to really improve or, or produce like near-term uh, commercial advantage in this technology. So the second focus is connectivity. Like I said, the feedback we've been getting sort of unanimously and resoundingly over the last few years is more connected devices. What I'm showing here is the overall icing spin Hamiltonian. There's two energy scales that are important. There's A of S and B of S, which are the transverse field and the problem at, um, Hamiltonian energy scale, respectively. Now, we've known for a long time that we can build more connected qubits. We can just make the qubits much longer, they cross more devices, and voila, you have a much more connected processor. The price you pay, though, is that the inductance and the capacitance of those devices goes up as you increase the size of the devices. The key energy scales, A of S and B of S, drop rapidly. And so you can build a more connected processor, but the price you pay is that these energy scales uh, decrease very, very quickly. A key goal for us in our next generation technology is to keep the energy scales consistent, to not drop these scales at the same time that we increase connectivity. We're doing this with an architecture that we're calling Pegasus. So Pegasus is a significant increase in connectivity over the Chimera architecture that we've been developing for the last few years. It's in fact, it's the, the biggest architectural change since our very first processor, the D-Wave 1, that we, that we, that we, um, that we made uh, commercial in 2011. So the reason why we can keep the devices compact and we don't need to grow the overall size is that we made some big changes to the fabrication stack to make our circuit a lot more dense and compact. What you can see on the left here is a, a picture of uh, a Chimera C16. So this is the basic topology that we have right now in our, in our processor product. So it's a K44 unit cell, an 8 qubit unit cell that we've, we've gridded out in a 16 by 16 array. On the right, you can see a picture of our Pegasus P6 prototype. So this prototype has 680 devices in it, um, but the connectivity increase means that the, rep the graph representational complexity of this circuit compared to Chimera's is, is, is very, very similar. And we've demonstrated functionality of this, the, this, the, uh, the, the P6 prototype of the circuit that you see on the right. This is another view of these two circuits where I'm showing basically a schematic of the C16 and the P6 on the left and the right, respectively. In the schematic, all the qubits are represented by blue dots, and couplers between the qubits are, are these, these light blue lines. In the table, I'm showing some basic statistics for that compare these two structures of these two architectures. I'm showing device counts and degrees for C16 scale processors, uh, as well as an increasing size of Pegasus going from P6 to P12 to P16. So the first thing to note is the degree per qubit. The max degree per qubit in Chimera is six. And we've increased this by almost a factor of three in Pegasus. So the Pegasus circuit three that, that we're that we're developing has max degree of 15. This connectivity gives you a big win. You can see even at the P6 scale, when you have many fewer qubits in your, in your circuit, the number of couplers in the circuit is actually comparable to the C16. By the time you scale up Pegasus to a P16 scale, so you have couple, uh, almost an order of magnitude more couplers than you have in the, in the, at the C16 scale. Now, anything that users want to do is going to require some embedding. It's very rare, if not, uh, I think we've ever seen an application come in that maps directly onto the Chimera topology. There's always a minor embedding step that's required. And this is a step where you take physical qubits and you chain them together with strong couplings and build a logical qubit that's much more highly connected. Now, a key goal in the embedding that we're doing is to try to minimize the size of the logical qubits. As you build more and more devices and, and chain them together, the dynamics slow down. You would like to keep these dynamics fast, and so you want to keep your logical qubits uh, very, very small, or as small as you can make them. 
So you can see again in this table, I'm showing representation of a, a few different topologies from complete connectivity, the cubic lattice, which we've been studying, uh, factoring circuit. So these are just some example topologies that are not native to Chimera that you need to do this minor embedding step with. You can see that what I'm showing in the, in the blue is the max chain length. The chain lengths is, that are required to represent each one of these graphs or each one of these topologies. And there's a big reduction between the C16 and the P6 over a factor of two reduction in the, the logical Kiba size needed to represent these graphs. So again, the P6 has fewer qubits, but a similar number of couplers, and the representational complexity of Pegasus at this scale is similar to the C16 scale. And this is one final uh, picture that I like a lot. So this is a, a picture showing an embedding where we've, we've constructed an embedding to where we keep the average degree of the device, the logical devices at 24 and 25 for the Chimera C16 and the Pegasus respectively. This produces just over 300 logical qubits. Um, you can see that the chain length required to represent these, these two very equivalent topologies is, is over a factor of two different in Pegasus versus Chimera. My colleague Walter uh, Vinci is going to speak a little bit more about using um, quantum annealing in, in, in our QPUs uh, for quantum machine learning. And he's done a study where he's showing that the increased connectivity in Pegasus, uh, um, he's simulated it, it delivering a big advantage in terms of a machine learning algorithm in, 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 in sampling application. I'm going to move briefly on to what we're calling system overhead. So I think I spoke about a core, the core annealing time that we spend transforming the Hamiltonian from some initial state to some final state. This is just one piece of the overall system overhead. What I'm showing here in this cartoon are slices of time required to send a problem down to the hardware, run the quantum annealing algorithm, and pull samples back. The blue is what we're calling programming time. There's some amount of time required just to communicate the problem and program the on-chip memory to represent a particular, uh, or to tune the process to solve a particular problem. The anneal time is shown in green here, so this is the evolution time of the Hamiltonian. And then there's a time required to read out the processor to pull the spin state at the end of the annealing process off the processor. In addition, in the pink, we have a programmable uh, duty cycle delay where you can insert a delay between the end of the readout cycle and, start, and the start of the next annealing cycle. So you can see here, of, of all the times, the green time is just a subset of the, of the overall times. A key goal for us in our next generation processor is as we grow the complexity of the graph and the number of qubits and couplers, the number of devices that are in the circuit, we want to keep these overheads fixed or shrink them compared to where we sit with the C16, the 2,000 qubit technology today. So what, we, what we're projecting for a P16 scale circuit is that the programming time actually should shrink and the readout time should stay relatively similar to or very, very similar to the, the C16 scale of the 2,000 qubit uh, technology. Just a few more words about the readout. One of the, the ways that we are achieving this, this fixed overhead um, as the number of devices grows is with a new device that we're calling the Frequency and Sensitivity Tunable Resonator, or FASTER for short. So shown here is a schematic of a PSIC processor where the qubits are represented in these, these vertical and horizontal black lines. At the end of the annealing process, classical information, the spin state of the qubit is, is read out via shift registers that traverse the processor vertically and horizontally and bring this data to these faster circuits. At the two ends of each one of the shift register, we have one of these faster resonators. These re resonators are just narrow band tank circuits whose center frequency is tuned um, and changes with the presence of data, either counter circulating or circulating current in the last stage of the shift register. By sending in a microwave tone down to this, this resonator, you can actually do a transmission measurement and infer very quickly the state of the qubit. The nice thing is because they're narrow band, you can gang many of them up on a single transmission line. In this case, for this P6 prototype, we have all of the orange fasters on, on one microwave chain and all of the green fasters on another microwave chain. So we're able to actually uh, have very comp uh, compact microwave infrastructure to do fast readout of the processor. The last couple of minutes, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some, some work that we're doing to lower the environmental noise in our processor. So why do we care about environmental noise? Why do we care about cubic coherence? How does it actually affect us? Well, it affects us in, in many ways. There's the mundane way, which is that one of our F flux noise fluctuations in the bias of the qubit produces icing specification errors. We distort the target Hamiltonian of our problem. 
Some recent work by Tamim and Ite has shown that as we increase the number of devices or the scale of our processor, we need these, these classical sources or these misspecifications to shrink. And we need to shrink depending on the problem class um, uh, significantly as the size of the processor grows. So we need the 1 over f fluctuations or misspecifications to be scaling down with the size of the processor. Qubits that are coupled to a flux noise environment have their dynamics slowed down. So the effect of tunneling dynamics slows down, and it slows down in direct proportion to the amplitude of this flux noise. Slower tunneling rates during quantum annealing are going to blunt any quantum advantage that you're getting from multi-qubit tunneling or single qubit tunneling. Lower noise boosts this, and it's a key goal for us uh, in our, our, low noise, uh, our low noise stack um, uh, technology development. Finally, something that we're really uh, starting to appreciate more over the last year as we study the processor in sampling mode, as we, as we try to look at how the processor does for quantum machine learning, is that the, the flux noise environment, the spin and environment around the, the, the devices, has a memory effect. At the end of the anneal, we burn in the state of the qubits in the, the, this environment, and we pr start producing correlations between samples. And so we think this really reduces the efficacy of, of processors in the presence of the spin environment as, as good samplers. There's a couple of figures here that I pulled from some work that was led by uh, a team at Google as well as some researchers at Ames. Um, a couple of years ago, this was published where uh, this, this a cluster experiment was done where all of the devices inside a unicell on Chimera were tightly coupled together. And then random problems on those are a particular combination of, of biases were applied to those clusters. And what was found is that the hardware, the quantum annealer, scaled much better than simulated annealing. And a key piece of this was eight qubit co-tunneling. The processor was able to flip and co-tunnel up to eight qubits, or even more than that at a time. And the Google team actually got very good agreement between a, a model and the, 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 the actual data that was coming out of the hardware. Now, co-tunneling, like I said, gets slowed down by flux noise. The higher the noise, the higher noise you have in the process, the slower, down, the slower your tunneling is. So a key route to quantum advantage and quantum annealing, we think, comes from lowering the noise and boosting those tunneling rates. We've had an active noise development program at D-Wave for many years. Um, the basic idea is that we have witness samples um, that are very, with devices that are or designed very similar to the way that they would be designed in a full processor. And we're cycling several hundred of these, over 300 um, witness samples per year, and we're characterizing some key metrics, some key measurements of, of in situ flux noise, um, in situ uh, tunneling line widths. And what we're doing is, is identifying modifications in our fabrication stack that significantly lower flux noise and boost qubit coherence. What I'm showing in the plot on the right is, is one of these metrics. We're calling this the, the tunneling line width. So we do a tunneling measurement between the two flux eigenstates of a flux qubit, and we measure the broadening of this line width due to flux noise. So this line width represents an integrated flux noise that the qubit experiences during this tunneling process or by proxy during the annealing process. And what I'm plotting is, is uh, measurements or typical measurements across several of our, our fabrication generations from the very early R&D phase to what we're using to produce our devices now to what we're looking at in terms of our low noise stack uh, recently with some of the changes that we've made. And we're able to see just sort of dramatic changes and reductions of flux noise as we zero in and we identify the things that we need to do in our fabrication or design to lower our noise. A key goal here, though, is that the low, uh, low noise stack, anything that we change in our fabrication, must be compatible with producing processors at large scale. We know how to build very low noise, very coherent devices now that are absolutely useless for any kind of large scale quantum technology. So what we need to do is be able to do this in situ um, and realize it in a full scale circuit. This is the final piece of data that, that we're excited about that I want to speak about today. Um, so with some of these recent circuits, we've done a measurement of qubit transition width. So this is a measurement where we tilt the qubit, the flux qubit, by applying a bias on its body. And we study the amount of bias we need to apply to move the qubit from all up to all down. So it's a, it's a measurement of the signal that you need to either fully polarize the qubit in the up state or the down state. So we've done this measurement across a, a broad range of anneal times and a broad range of mixing chamber temperatures, over four orders of magnitude and anneal time, and we've changed the mixing chamber temperature at which the qubits are mounted from 12.5 millikelvin up to 30 millikelvin. 
What you can see here is that for slower anneal times, for anneal times are on the order of, of tens to hundreds of microseconds, the transition width scales with the mixing chamber temperature. This is good evidence for the huge picture here is that the qubit is coming into thermal equilibrium with, with its environment, and we're controlling the temperature of that environment by controlling the temperature of the mixing chamber. As we start annealing more quickly, though, we see that this transition width starts dropping. Moreover, as we anneal more quickly and we see the, the transition width drop, we see the differences between the different temperatures shrink and disappear. And then by the time we hit anneal times that are, are sub one microsecond, we're seeing that the, the differences, we're basically seeing the, the, the transition width be relatively independent or completely independent of that mixing chamber thermometer and the mixing chamber environment. We're interpreting this as the qubits annealing fast enough to decouple or doesn't have enough time to come into thermal equilibrium with this environment. And this is why the, the transition would start decreasing. And then on the fast anneal side, what we're actually doing is something that I've heard externally other people call coherent quantum annealing. I've heard, I've heard this in, in several places. And the idea is that you're annealing quickly enough that your transition widths are now not thermally dominated. They're dominated by the, a quantum effect, the transverse field. The larger the transverse field is during a measurement, the broader this transition is. And so we're actually probing the regime where the transition width is completely dominated or, or almost completely dominated by that transverse field. So this, this is a heuristic picture. We have some evidence recently from some modeling that we've done, which I'm showing in the lower right, where the qualitative features of this across this, this bandwidth are, are captured by, this, by a simple block redfield model where we plugged in a flux noise amplitude that we've measured in our devices and we've captured sort of the qualitative behavior across these regimes of thermalization and decoupling from the environment and then this coherent quantum annealing regime for faster anneals. I want to advertise a talk by one of my colleagues uh, later on this afternoon. Uh, my colleague Cheng Cheng Dang is going to talk about some new coupling technology that we've been studying. So recent success in quantum simulation has really pointed the way to an, an area where we're really excited about make, applying quantum annealing technology. So these lattice simulations um, have us very excited. And we think that more general Hamiltonians having a more complicated, broader array of connectivity or connections between devices should really increase the array of quantum simulations that can be run. This also gives us an early step toward a, a path to universality, to moving this technology to uh, a, a fully universal quantum, and, uh, quantum computer, or adiabatic quantum computer. In particular, we're studying a two-qubit circuit where we have both a sigma z, sigma z interaction and a sigma y, sigma y interaction. And I'll leave the, uh, the rest of the details to my colleague this afternoon, and he'll go into a lot of these, the, the, uh, the, the low-level measurements of the circuit. So in summary, we've been really focusing, like I said, on four key technology areas. The expanded control of the annealing process has, has really allowed us to do these quantum simulation experiments at scale, as well as open the door to some really exciting uh, hybridization uh, techniques, how we hybridize the, the, the processor with, with classical heuristics. The Pegasus topology, a pivot away from Chimera to a much more connected topology, is a, a major architectural change, um, and it's a major boost in connectivity. So we're really excited about uh, this, 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 this new architecture, and we've been able to maintain single qubit energy scales as we increase this, this connectivity. We've been focusing on system overheads. Again, as we look at overall um, performance of quantum annealing at scale, as we move toward commercial advantage uh, and looking for commercial advantage, the wall clock time matters, not just the core annealing time, but all the overheads that go into sending a problem down to the chip and then reading spin states off the chip. And finally, a lower noise stack that's able to actually produce large-scale processors at this scale really allows us to study the performance, the, effic the efficacy of quantum annealing on processors that have much lower flux noise and much more coherence. And this is something that we're really excited to dig into over the next few years. Thank you. Very interested in your um, uh, tunneling line width metric that you used and the, the progression over time. Uh, how well does that correlate with any um, performance measures for solving problems? 
So we're doing bottom-up measurements of tunneling rates in single qubits and in, in clusters of devices, and we're comparing against the model you'd predict as those tunneling line widths start coming down, and we're getting very good agreement at the single and, and the, the, the multiple qubit scale from that, the bottom up. So we're taking an approach right now of just making sure that we're, we're measuring in situ those tunneling rates start increasing. And then from the top down, I mean, we're, we're, what we'd like to do is, is show that uh, building a, a, a much bigger circuit at scale is offering advantage in, in optimization problems, and that's something that we're, we're pushing toward. I guess what I mean is, do you have any um, like system level performance data that correlates to that um, increase in the uh, tunneling performance? Not at the top level, not at the, the, full, uh, at the, the full circuit scale. We're, we're doing the bottom-up studies right now, but that, that will come soon. One more question. Hi, so I also wanted to ask about this tunneling line width. Mm -hmm. uh, so is this something uh, that's measured in, in other systems as well, like atoms or ions or transmons or something like this? And can you compare it to your numbers? Um, so the tunneling line width is a measurement of the overall flux noise amplitude. So we can definitely compa start comparing this to, to other systems. So um, I don't see this reported a lot in, in other superconducting efforts. Um, but we're also looking at other noise metrics that seem that, that are, are correlating with tunneling line width. And those are a lot more, a lot, lot closer to what people are tracking in, in other efforts. So, so that's something that we're going to move toward uh, more and more as we, as, as we develop this low noise process moving toward, toward those comparisons. All right, let's uh, thank our um, speaker Trevor again, and uh, more questions.